be adaptive. So, you know, that's, that's what it is. Um, you, you know, if you said to me, sorry, David, we're going to take away your license, not that there is one, but, you know, you're going to take your li away your license to do leadership development work, and you're not allowed to talk about the brain um, using, you know, in leadership development work. You can do anything you want in leadership development, but you can't talk about the brain anymore. Um, I would have to go and be a busker on the street or something else because I, I could not go back and do organizational change work or leadership work without the brain anymore because I hit so many brick walls that I no, you know, I, I no longer hit all those brick walls and I'm able to move around them in many, many ways. So that's kind of what's, you know, why I think this is important. Um, and in summary, there's four kind of real benefits. Then we'll get to some of the core research. So it's increasing this openness to learning, which ultimately creates more adaptive behavior. It highlights what to do more of, explains things we didn't know, and finally improves the quality of interventions itself. Um, do you know that um, you know, pilots are tested for competence, but leaders are not? <laughs> Doctors are tested for competence, le you know, leaders are not. We're not tested particularly for competence in any way. We can actually measure leaders, we can measure brain functioning in some interesting ways to identify people's capacity to self-regulate and to you know, read other people's emotions and all sorts of stuff. And we can, we can actually improve the quality of interventions as well as measure leadership programs. So four big surprises emerging out of the brain research. Four big surprises. I'm gonna just gonna give you these at kind of high level. By the way, um, I'll, I'll pause and, and people might be about to ask, uh, can I get these slides? If you're about to ask, can I get these slides, especially that lady there. Um, yeah, you, the, which is a perfect segue into the next piece. I will send out the slides to anyone who drops a card over at the table over there. And I'll also send out um, half a dozen different papers that will probably come up during this talk. I'll send out the introduction to the field paper, which is you know, fully referenced about where it all comes from. Um, and uh, I'll send out the neuroscience of leadership paper as well. Where's Janelle? Janelle's in the room here somewhere. Is Janelle still here somewhere? There she is, she's out there. Um, can you just make a note of the papers that I promised? Because I always forget once I say them. The neuroscience of leadership and the introduction to neuroleadership and the slides. I'll send those out to you so that you don't have to make notes. So we're gonna just give you a high level on kind of four big surprises emerging out of the research that explains organizational change in new ways, and then we'll take your questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions that are up to there before we go on, before we kind of dive in? I've done a lot of sort of uh, uh, context, giving you context and kind of rationale and, and all of that, and now we'll get into it. Anyone have any questions before we go on? There's one over there, yeah. Yeah. The question, I'll repeat questions so everyone can hear, you know, what is it that causes the self and social capacity to, or the capacity for self and social to go down? Um, you, can, you can explain it in a number of different ways. Um, the easiest way to understand it is, um, it'll involve a, a sort of fairly simple brain drawing. Um, <laughs> sim brain and simple, to, to don't go in the, the same sentence very often, do they? Um, if that's the I there, um, let's, let's, do a, let's do a little experiment to, 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 to illustrate it. I'm going to call out a question, you call out an answer. That's the way it goes. I'll do it five or six times. Uh, what's two plus two? Five plus five? Ten plus ten? Twenty plus twenty? Fifty-six plus seventy-nine? No answer? Okay. Very good, 135, excellent. Uh, Fifty-six divided by seventy-nine? Any savants? Some people can do it, but it's, you know, it's tricky. So the first few didn't require conscious processing. It's hardwired. I'm watching my daughters, you know, learn this stuff now, embedding it um, into long-term memory, no effort. Adding up 56 and 79 um, is a completely different game. You've got to use your rational processes, okay, your rational resources. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to answer your question and actually uh, sort of talk about the first point at the same time. Um, you've got to use rational resources. And in particular, there's a region of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, or PFC for short. And this is a very small region of the brain and tires easily and is literally um, compared to, or conscious processes involve the PFC, not just the PFC, many others, but conscious processes, very, very important, in, you know, PFC is very important. Non-conscious processes often don't involve the PFC or they involve a lot of other functions in, in particular. Um, and the difference between conscious and non-conscious is the difference between about a cubic meter and the Milky Way in terms of uh, the amount of information held in there. 
And so what, what happens is this capacity to add up 56 and 79 is pretty small at the best of times. You know, it, we, can, you know we, we, we stump a room of people with that. And most business challenges contain more information than, than four digits being you know, manipulated, right? Most business decisions are very, very complex. And um, the trouble is that there's a direct correlation between the activation and capacity of the PFC to hold information. So there's a direct correlation between how much you can hold in mind and the activation of the limbic system. The limbic system, I'm sure you've heard of, the amygdala, the threat response, or the fight or flight, all that. Um, so as the limbic system becomes aroused, it actually takes away resources from the PFC and makes the brain noisy. Okay? And the trouble is that leadership is inherently threat producing. The brain's organizing principle is minimize danger, so stay away from threat or move toward reward. Okay, um, toward reward. And unfortunately, the, the very act of being a leader, the very act of, of, of you know, stepping up being a leader, creates a lot of noise in the brain, creates a strong threat response. It's because of the amount of uncertainty you have to deal with, the amount of complexity, the number of people watching you, um, and the number of what are called incomplete intentions. So the number of things you're not able to complete. Your brain does not like incomplete crosswords, and it does not like incomplete projects, and it does not like incomplete intentions when you have a thousand of them in your organization. So leadership, as you go up from managing you know, 10 to 100 to 1,000, you've got this massive jump in, in basically allostatic load, and it takes a lot of capacity to quieten this down. And essentially, a lot of the time, it's just reducing two things. It's reducing prefrontal function, and even more importantly, it's reducing the capacity for quiet insight. And insight, you know, the, the number of insights you have is very, very correlated to where you are in this state. There's a huge difference uh, between, uh, it's about a 50% difference in the number of insights you have between a tiny uh, threat state versus a tiny reward state. So it's, it's a slightly long answer, but essentially uh, leaders, uh, as they go up the ladder, are experiencing significant amounts of increased threat, increased uncertainty, increased noise. They have a lot less insights and a lot less prefrontal function. Now, there are two, um, there's many, many things happen in the PFC. The PFC isn't just executive function. Two really important centers within it. One is the MPFC, medial prefrontal cortex, MPFC. That is central for, for thinking about yourself and thinking about other people. If, if I say to you, uh, what's your name? Gayla. Gayla, if I say to you, uh, think about you know, what, you, uh, you know, what you, you ate for lunch a week ago, you would activate this region and your memory centers and others. And if I said, you know, think about who you had for lunch, you know, who, who you met, met for lunch with and what they were doing. <laughs> we're in the wilds here. <laughs> if, who, you, who you met with for lunch, um, you would also activate the same region. And it turns out that thinking about your own goals and other people's goals activates the same circuitry. Thinking about you know, yourself and others activates the same circuitry. This is why, by the way, doing mindfulness work increases compassion. Understanding yourself increases understanding of others and vice versa because they're two sides of the same coin. But without getting too deep, neither of them really exist. They're both representations in the brain uh, of, you know, of a person based on you know, past and future. Um, but anyway, the uh, medial prefrontal cortex is in there, and the other region that's really important is the brain's braking system, which is the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. There will be a test on that later, in case you're wondering. Um, but the RVLPFC is the right and left temple. It's called the brain's braking system, and that's the self-regulation system. So essentially, you're pulling resources away from your ability to think about people and your ability to focus, uh, and that doesn't go so well. So that's the longer answer to uh, the situation. Yeah, thank you.